we are. I'm Margaret Ridley and I'm President of Oral History Queensland, so welcome everyone um, to tonight's panel session. So we're here to uh, listen to our, how our panellists interrogate interviews. First, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. The location of the State Library on Kurulpa Point was historically a significant meeting and gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people. We proudly continue uh, that tradition to here today. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the role of traditional, the traditional owners of the land as the keepers of oral history and oral um, traditions, and that's been for millennia. So, just onto some housekeeping bits before we get into uh, meeting our panelists. We're being the the session's being recorded, so. Um, It'll be available online via the Oral History Queensland website, so if you're a member, you'll be alerted. If you're not a member, uh, you can go to the website and find out how to become a member, so it will be available later. If we can keep the questions to the end of the session so that you know people come around with roving mics and it makes it um, easier for the recording process if we can have someone people talking into the mics. So I'd like to introduce our panellists now. Um, I'm going to start with Jen. Jen's a psychologist, an oral historian, but um, a playback theatre practitioner. She's also the president of Red Threads uh, Stories Australia, which is a not-for-profit not organisation which connects communities using creative processes, playback theatre and storytelling. And then we've got Michelle Rayner, who joined the ABC, and I can't believe this, in 1986, and produced, uh, has produced most forms... Yeah, that's right, a baby, as a baby, um, has produced most forms of radio. She re has been in, social, in the Social History Unit since 1993, and she received the New South Wales Premier's History Award for her documentary, Passes and Pathways. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with her name, if not her voice. Yeah, yay. And then we, um, I'd like to introduce David Burton, who's a playwright and an author. He's just published a memoir, and it's How to Be Happy. Um, it, it won the Tex Prize for Children and Young Adults Writing. He's best known for his community and theatre work, and his uh, play that's going to be premiering for QTC this year is uh, St Mary's in Exile, which is uh, in the verbatim tradition. And Gavin here, um, who well known to people who frequent the State Library. He has worked at the State Library for 10 years across a range of areas. He's managed ar the archival collections. Uh, he's um, into delivering digital training to, to undertaking oral history and digital storytelling projects. He's currently the acting executive man manager of Queensland Memory. So that's our panellists. I'm going to go and sit down and um, try and make this as intimate as I can and we'll uh, start asking some questions. Because I was the first chair on the... <laughs> I was the first chair. Well, thank you for having me, for having us tonight. It's really exciting to be here and um, to see you coming along tonight who feel as passionate as I do, I guess we do, about oral history. And I think about history in general, really. Um, history kind of gets you, doesn't it, and gets you in and you become passionate about it for, for the rest of your life. That's what happened to me when I joined the ABC. Um, I was literally an intern in 1986, <laughs> but um, I was lucky enough um, to get a job um, first in drama, but then later in, in the social history unit, um, which was founded by my colleague, Tim Bowden. Uh, and it was a totally wonderful, wonderful experience to, to work there. So basically, I, my experience of oral history was working on a program called Hindsight, largely, um, from which finished last year and has been morphed into um, a week daily documentary slot on Radio National called Earshot. And we do broadcast um, social history documentaries in that, and increasingly, actually, oral history documentaries, which is great. So everything old is new again, really, it feels like to me. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about um, how radio oral history documentaries differ from the use of oral history for scholarship um, or for archival purposes, 
um, or for, I guess, other ways, you know, documenting and preserving um, memory. Because uh, I think there is a really big distinction and over the last few years I've worked with a bunch of academic historians on a big project capturing um, six, seven generations of Australian memory through oral histories and that's been a really interesting experience in working out the tensions between academic historians who go and record five hour oral history, life histories. Um, with the purposes of how you record an oral history for a radio documentary or a set of oral histories. Um, so Radio National has a really long tradition of oral history um, recording and I think actually, I think every time you turn the radio on you hear a form of oral history, testimony, storytelling. Richard Fider's program is really in a way, you know, the triumph of someone telling their story. So just to preface that and sort of not say that what we did on hindsight was anything very special. It was sort of born out of a tradition, really. And it points to the, to the affinity, I think, of radio and oral history. There's a real, you know, it is this sort of beautiful companionship, really, the, the, the sound of someone's voice and what the radio can do, that intimacy. Um, what I would say is that the nature of oral history radio documentaries has really changed, the sound of them has changed... Um, since Tim Bowden began making his groundbreaking documentaries 30 years ago, Time Belong Master, um, the, the Papuan experience, um, the prisoners of war um, under Nippon. Um, although, as I said, you know, on Earshot we've been, we've gone back to this 28 minute slot, 30 minute slot, and a lot of them are very similar in sound. You know, we've stripped back, we've gone back just to the, to the pure voice with some sound effects. Um, as I said, oral history informs so much of the broadcast media. Um, but the, the real distinction is what we do with what we do with oral histories when we record them for the radio. And I probably should play you something because we've gone to a huge amount of trouble to um, get this set up here. And so I'll just click on that and partly because we're working with an Apple Mac here. <laughs> Margaret's glory boxes. Way. Have you ever heard of glory box? Well, my sister had a glory box. Two minutes. The week before her wedding, she took off from work. Oh, we'll Anne and I got moved out of the bedroom, and, and we'll Moya's glory box and buffet got moved into the bedroom. I think Mum had made new bedspread and curtains and things for it. Probably twice a day, at least four days of that week. Moya had people come in to view her glory box and Mum had to provide morning and afternoon tea. And to me, after being there to help Moya fold up things and put them back in drawers and that a couple of times, that was it, I was out of there. I helped Mum with the afternoon teas and that. And I thought, what a lot of rot. The Glory Box by Mary Gilmore, 1925. Says so she... I've got, got me glory, glory box. box. The mantel drape is made. The top is all set out in clocks. The centre's filled with braid. The edge, it is three deep in fringe. You'd love to see it swing. But devil a sheet and towel she had. The poor old thing. So that was a, an extract from, um, from a short piece about glory boxes that was a sort of series of oral histories um, strung together but you can hear the use of um, sound elements there, music, sound effects, um, even poetry. Um, in fact that's, a, that's an archival recording of Mary Gilmore reading, um, you know, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful luxury of the ABC radio archives. So what we do when we go out to record an oral history for a radio documentary, we're very directed. We, we don't record five-hour interviews. We, we go to that person knowing that they've got a memory of a coal mine strike or a flood um, in Queensland um, or growing up in, um, in Malay Town, a, a, a place in Cairns that no longer exists. Um, we're very directed um, and we often go knowing something you know, about that person, a biography. Um, clearly, you come back always with more material than you ever have, you know, the, the hour-long interview because people can't compartmentalise a part of their life. They want to tell you their whole story. Um, the selection of the extracts for, from oral history recordings is a really considered business when, you, when you're thinking about a radio documentary. Um, you're looking for 
a strong historical narrative, the clarity of the information. You're looking for the, the compelling nature of the story. And that, that woman with that memory of glory boxes, you know, she was just gold, really, um, because she was a great storyteller. Uh, the vividness of the storytelling, how it's said. And of course, the third factor is the sound quality of the recording. And compared to when I began working in radio, um, in radio oral history, and we'd be approached by academics or by passionate people working in oral history and in history, and then we'd, we'd get these terrible cassette recordings. <laughs> and, you know, whatever, you, you, it was such a, a loss at times. Um, and um, I had recently had an experience of a colleague of mine, no, someone in, who works in public history, who was doing a, um, a series of um, an archival project with a hospital in Melbourne. And all these old surgeons had been interviewed back in the 90s. And the person had used one of those dictaphone things that has got these kind of micro cassettes. And here were these incredible stories of medical practice way back in the 30s and 40s. And there was no way we could lift those. <laughs> because in fact, the machine that they'd been recorded on didn't exist anymore. Um, no problem with that these days. We're all out there recording on our phones and, um, and it's, it's a wonderful, liberating time to be working in, I think. Um, for me, the quality of the storytelling is the main consideration. I know that sounds probably somewhat arrogant, but um, our primary outcome is resulting in a really powerful story that you as an audience member, as a listener, will be engaged in. Um, the constraints of using oral history in audio documentaries, there are lots of constraints. References to name people, to places, may make sense in the context of a whole story, but could be a liability in a short extract. So radio, lis radio listeners from different parts of the country are not necessarily going to pick up whether the place name refers to a beach or an outer suburb. So if someone says we went on holiday, um, when we went on holiday, it's much easier to say than when we went to Lawn or when we went to Sandgate because someone might know where Sandgate is. Similarly, the use of pronouns, he, she, can be very unclear in an extract. We want, you know, when my younger brother or when mum said to me this or when she, rather than when she said that. For a radio producer, an oral history interview that touches very briefly on many themes is less useful than a more tightly focused interview that limits itself to one topic. And I'll play you this grab from a, a really beautiful, um, we used to have a, a half hour oral history program slot called Verbatim which was really wonderful. It was a kind of a, a nugget of someone's life story. And this interview um, with um, a woman who became quite a well-known um, couturier in, in Sydney was from that program. And, yeah. I went to school to a bigger city where I stayed with my grandparents who had one of the biggest hotels in that um, city. And the first floor of the hotel was occupied by the family. So we had our own apartment and we had a nanny who looked after. Then the war came and the Germans closed the school. Because it was anti-German, when the school was closed, uh, there was nowhere else to go. And I started to think what I'm going to do and that's when I started to contemplate to design and uh, had millinery and all sorts of things. That part, I started to involve myself. The war started about 1940 and 41, 42, they started to talk about it, that they're going to collect all the girls between 16 and 20 to take them to... Germany for to the factories to work and so on. I had no option. They collected us all and then they shifted us all in these trains, uh, cattle trains, to Germany. The cattle trucks took Elizabeth to a farm very close to Auschwitz. There, she worked with 20 women from various countries, including many prisoners of war and Seventh-day Adventists. But she was the only Slovakian. It was a farm where they supplied the army with food. It was a chicken farm. And they were also rabbits, you know, the Angora rabbits. And we had to pluck them, cut them and pluck the wool, make wool out of it for the army. 
it was the old castle, and that's where we were accommodated. And then, of course, in the evening, they locked us up, and it's just like uh, we've been looked after. We couldn't run away. Um, so you heard that. I'll, I'll speed along because Margaret's just giving me the wind up, even though we were told we had 20 minutes. Um, that's true, that's true. Um, uh, so you would have heard that filleting, that, um, that what we call filleting, which is editing, um, collapsing right down. And my colleague, Claudia, who made that program, it was much easier for her to jump in and concentrate a whole lot of um, the, the Elizabeth Bence, the woman who was speaking with life, into a few sentences just to sort of carry the story along. Um, the sound tools, the curatorial elements, just that very beautiful music. Um, we recognise that sometimes, as radio makers, oral histories alone can't tell the full history. Um, um, I think we've gone back to the idea that you sort of stick to a simple story now. Um, and again, a audience is our primary focus. You know, audience, we're very audience driven. Um, you, I, I sound very kind of pragmatic, but I think partly that's what media drives, working in media drives you to become quite pragmatic. But there's always a sense of trust and um, veracity with your interview, E. I think it's sometimes easy to assume that we go and appropriate someone's story, but I think that there's something really interesting in oral history practice that it's about the inti intimacy both of the relationship between interviewer and interviewee, and there's always this sense that you will trust, you, you will honour that person's story. Um, and thank goodness that, that, that the interviewee often understands that too. I think that I've, I could count probably on one hand or two fingers really the times that people, I've had people say, oh, but you know, you didn't include that bit in my story or you didn't include that. Um, so basically, storytelling drives us and I could bang on about the rise and rise of storytelling, the American model. I don't know if anyone listens to This American Life, but that's a new fashion now that's come through and um, has kind of set a different way of storytelling. The other thing I'd sort of wanted to throw out there because I mentioned it before about cassette tapes is that I think we're living in a great age for oral history practice at the moment because we've got these fantastic recorders and people are recording great sound quality and I think people are really valuing the power of the individual story a lot more and the importance of it um, both as a, a digital archive as a sound archive and um, I think that's really valorised what we do um, and made it as political as it ever was, I guess. Um, when Tim Bowden and Bill Bunbury began those programs 30 years ago, it was part of that rise of the, the democratisation of history, you know, the power of everyone's story, and it was really important in getting a whole lot of really powerful stories out there. Um, um, I'm trying to think of the project that they worked on with um, the late Hank Nelson, which was really pre-Stolen Gens, um, and bringing them home, I think, was almost before that, but really important stories that were told through that those, those early years of oral history practice. I want to finish by thinking about terminology here because, um, and maybe this doesn't exercise anyone else in the room, but um, sometimes I get asked if I think about myself as an oral historian and I don't really know how to answer that. I think about myself as someone who's passionate about history and I mean, I love, I, this is a very creative thing, what we get to do, what I get to do. It is the most creative thing, I think. Um, and I'm passionate about sound. I think sound gives you an intimacy that you don't get in television, even though we're seduced and immersed and drowning in images all the time now. I think there's something about the audio medium that is so resilient, and it's about that intimacy of that person in your head and the empathy that you get from that. So I'd love to play you more, but, um, I know Margaret will... Yeah, <laughs> I'll just... You go there. I'll go here. And I'll say thank you to Michelle. I nearly... I think Michelle nearly lost her job over something I had emailed on her behalf when hindsight was um, in jeopardy. And I sent an email off to Mark... Scott. Scott saying... You know, in Barcelona, um, the voice of the people was now being heard and the, um, the, the left had its opportunity to tell the history and how could you take hindsight away? And so thank you for reminding us. And also, conservative government, I made a series about the Tea Party, which is incredibly powerful, oral 
history interviews. I, I made a five-part series about the Liberal Party and liberalism. So. Oh, sorry, the balanced you. ABC there. So, <laughs> I'm going now. Jen, do you want me to? We can just see how we go. All right, right. we'll just improvise a little bit because <laughs> that's what I'm. Do I you guess want me to stand up? At. Yeah, that's that'd be All lovely. Right. So, um, it was interesting you saying, Michelle, about. Um, where you sit with oral history. In some ways, I'm an oral historian and I've done traditional oral histories, but tonight I'm talking more from my playback theatre hat, which is quite different. But there are certainly connections, and I guess there are also connections with, to some degree, with my psychology hat. But everybody has a story, and I guess that's what oral history is about, that we all have stories. Sitting here tonight, you will have been uh, triggered with different stories already, uh, that have been um, coming up as you hear about glory boxes and as you hear about uh, trains and you hear about concentration camps and factories and all the different stories that are there. So the way that I'm talking about story is through playback theatre. And playback theatre, and I think it Do would be... I can sit down. Do you, you, you're on your oh, way. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> on my way. I don't think uh, you need to Oh, well, maybe. We'll, we'll see, see how we see go. How we go. So um, playback theatre is a form of applied theatre where we listen and transform people's stories in, without script or planning. So it's totally improvised, it's totally in the moment, it's a spontaneous enactment. And I thought I'd show some photos because it's quite hard to get a sense of playback. Oh, and our purpose <coughs> in playback is primarily to honour the story of the person telling, telling their story, the teller. It's our main purpose. But it also is about community understanding, connection, can be celebration. It's a form of um, dialogue. It's a, certainly a form of drama. And it can have a therapeutic impact, although that's not its primary purpose, but it can. And so if this was a performance tonight, if we were doing a playback theatre performance tonight, we'd have on the stage four actors, three or four actors, a musician, and myself if I'm in the role of a conductor or the, the story facilitator or the MC. And we have very strong ritual rituals around playback and how it works. And the first part is beginning a conversation with you, the audience. So it's very much about finding out from you what are some of the stories and to start warming you up to some of the stories that are with you. So uh, I might begin by asking you, well, how are you feeling now? What's come up for you since you've arrived? Um, what was it like hearing Michelle's talk? Uh, I'll ask that question. What was it like hearing Michelle's talk? Fantastic. Evocative. Evocative. Inspiring. Inspiring. Nostalgic. Nostalgic. Yeah. yeah, going back, yeah. And we would, um, I would ask questions like that and then the actors would spontaneously play back some of those moments and feelings to you as a way of starting to warm up to a theme or a, a, a particular topic. So it's certainly about beginning a conversation with you, the audience. And I've got, just got some photos of um, some of the performances that we've done. And so, we're, as I said, we enact moments. The, the, the actors enact the moment uh, and the musician, the feeling of the moment with the, with the music. And we begin by just what we call uh, the internal experience, the feeling. And this is, again, uh, uh, the troop in acting back. Uh. So the next part is, as we get going, we invite the interview. So this is, I guess, the heart of the performance, where we actually invite somebody to come up and share a story. So they often leave their chair um, and move to the front of the stage, where we have here, um, in this example, someone telling a story. And the person um, volunteers. It's not something that, you know, you, you, know, you must tell a story. You know, you, 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 you come forward with a story. And all stories are welcome. So we never know exactly what the story is going to be. 
And my role as the, what I call the conductor is to help shape the stories for the audience and also for the uh, actors. And also my role is to encourage a diversity of stories over the evening or over the performance. And here again is um, somebody. We, we also ask the teller to choose different actors to be them in the story. Might be to choose their sister to be in the story. Whoever might be important people in the story that we're, we're enacting back. So it's very immediate. And then we have another story and another story. And each story builds um, and um, people respond. So that's something of playback to give you... Um, just a sense of it because a lot of people don't know what playback is and it's very hard to describe. Um, it, it, it's something to be experienced, I think. And so we, we perform publicly and also we, we contract from very many diverse different groups and we performed at the Oral History Conference a number of years ago in Brisbane. We've done performances, um, family oral his a woman who collected her family stories for oral histories and we she collected her family together and we enacted the stories that she'd, she'd collected. We uh, have done it for celebrating. Uh, I collected traditional oral, oral histories and wrote a book and then we launched that and um, the people who told stories that had been recorded or collected or written um, could be there, but so too could the others in the community. So it's very much the community's response as well to... Uh, the stories that they've heard. So we, we do work with many diverse groups. And one of, um, I guess I meant to say at the beginning, but one of my real passions is about hearing the stories of that we often don't hear, the untold stories. And so we've, we've really made a focus of working with people um, whose stories may not normally be told. So I've done quite a few performances with people with intellectual disability, uh, people with other disability, you know, all range, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered community. So w we've really focused on a broad range of different communities in the performances that we've done. Um, that's Queenslanders with Disability. Th they were celebrating their organisation. So we'd collected the stories uh, and then were um, um, doing a performance. So uh, a woman, Karen, came forward to tell her story about her connection to that organisation over 10 years. And then the actors played, played that back. And just recently we performed out at Eramanga for uh, um, the Channel Women and we performed in a riverbed. And so um, we heard the stories of women out west, outback women, and their experiences of resilience and d death. There were stories of all sorts of different um, experiences that they that they spoke of. But we gently warmed them up. We didn't kind of start there and it was all always their choice as to what stories are told. Uh, there's the troop being kangaroos. So is it is playback I hadn't thought about playback theatre as an oral history, you know, until Margaret and, and it's <laughs> funny kind of bringing my different worlds together because I hadn't thought I mean and and in some ways it is, and in other ways I don't know that it is. And um, um, there are things about the interview I think we'll discuss perhaps a little bit more. But it certainly warms up and stimulates people to tell stories. And it's um, letting people know what the stories are in a community. And often the untold stories. At that um, performance at Eramunga, um, there is a couple of women who and I've got a slide who told a story about finding dinosaur bones. And I said I'd give them a plug. Um, <laughs> and yeah. And previously they wouldn't have told that story. So it was something, and they told it in a community. And as a resp in response, people said, hey, that's really interesting. This is an important story. And someone from the ABC interviewed them. But there was a sense of uh, community being built too in that. So it was more than um, just their story, it was building the community. And it's very much about history from the bottom up. Sometimes it's history and sometimes it's, you know, well I guess it d that's the whole thing, yeah, history. And it's certainly a form of adding to the stories that have been collected in a different way. 
um, and allows responses to the story then and there in the moment. So the teller can respond to, the, to their story. Oh, yes, that was how it was. Or, no, you got that completely wrong or whatever it might be. But it's an immediate response. And as I said before, it can be used to launch uh, oral history projects. Um, that was a workshop rather than a performance that um, we did with a group to help warm them up to telling their stories and writing their stories. Oh, they're the they're couple, the, the dinosaur women. <laughs> I think it's in the Book of Science. Um, and that's them watching their story being told, uh, enacted back, you know, as they were watching their story being enacted back. Um, well, Learning and here we'll leave that for later, I think. Oh, so yep. is that um, and about respecting the teller, which is a very important part of what we do. But again, and maybe I'll leave that for for later. And one of the important things is that we always acknowledge the tellers, you, the tellers, at the end of the show. It's not our, it's not, well, it is our. You know, we're obviously part of it, but we're creating a show. We're creating a story. We're creating a community together. So it's about all of our stories um, is, is what it's about for playback. That, yeah, that I think I we're give you a, a, sense, you, a sense of playback. Can I have you, where am I? I want to be like um, <coughs> Parkinson and <coughs> move the guests a lot. Shall I come oh. to you? Oh, or? sorry. And that, oh. Was, that was a blatant, sorry, that's a blatant um, promotional thing. How do I turn? <laughs> We've got a pu public performance coming up in Brisbane. Now what do I do? Just ah, oh, there we go. All right. Did you want me here? I would love. I've you stolen here. your seat, Michelle. I'm terribly sorry. You get we'll moved. to shuffle along. Mm -hmm. But you know how it seems to magically happen on pa Parkinson's. Magically so cut away. The, the 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 person speaking is there. It's the ad break. It's the ad break. Make yourself a cup of tea. Or we advertise coals okay, to you or something. Yes. Are you asking me questions? I, I don't have to. Oh, I'm thank going goodness. To ask David some questions. These people were presenting, and I was going. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how that goes. Take my note. <laughs> uh, David, could you give us just a brief overview of how you come to interviewing? Why have we got you here tonight? Sure. Um, so I'm here predominantly because of my work as a playwright. I've written a book as well, but um, I'm mostly known for my theatre work at the moment. And there's a few... Um, I've, I've produced and written many shows, but... Um, I, I keep returning to this form of verbatim theatre. Um, my first interaction with verbatim theatre was um, a show by the name of April's Fool, which was um, produced in Toowoomba originally by the Empire Theatre. Um, the artistic director of the Empire Theatre at that time, Lewis Jones, came to me and, and um, he knew by association a family in town who had recently suffered um, the death of their young son, a uh, young man by the name of Christian, who um, three weeks shy of his 19th birthday died um, due to um, implications due to illicit drug use. I spent, um, and it was Lewis's mind that it had been some years since a substantial work about youth and drugs had been um, uh, made for theatre, um, specifically for young audiences and young regional audiences. So I spent some months interviewing the family, interviewing community members, interviewing people who knew Christian um, and building his story and from there building a theatrical work where it's similar kind of another step sideways from th uh, from playback theatre or radio where we I had the tapes of the interview material and um, coalesced that and made took 24 hours of interview material, put that into a 70-minute show um, where a cast of five or six actors then went through the very surreal experience of taking on those words and that dialogue and presenting it to the audience and even more surreal for interview subjects to then watch that process back. Um, obviously, very personal stories. Another example um, is work I've done for the Queensland Music Festival, um, work in Gladstone, pardon me, by a show by the name of Boomtown, a show by the name of Under the Sky in Logan, where I spent um, six months on and off in those communities interviewing people about their place. Um, what, you know, what does Gladstone mean? What does Logan mean? What, what is going on here? And then from that, drawing out themes 
as opposed to verbatim text, but drawing out themes from that to then go into a musical spectacular. Again, that's another, it's verbatim theatre, but it's another form. The most recent experience is St Mary's in Exile, which is a show about, I'll try and briefly tell this story, um, uh, a man by the name of Father Peter Kennedy and, and Father Terry Fitzpatrick um, ran St Mary's South Brisbane Church up the road, a Catholic church, did all sorts of wonderful and naughty things like bless gay couples and allow women to preach and were very open, um, wonderful community, um, managed to annoy some members of the um, Catholic church and eventually by a long process of negotiation were asked to leave and Peter and Terry left the Catholic church and took a community of about five or six hundred people with them to the TLC building down the road. And I did a very similar process of interviewing lots of people, getting lots of information and then distilling that into a show. Um, yes. Oh, Is that a, does that yeah, answer your question? That, that's, that's why that's, I'm here. That's why he's here. There was an, there was an interview element. Yes, I so, interview people. Um, the interview is the thing in oral history. Mm. So why has it been the thing for you? Why not just write plays? Um, well, I do write plays. Sorry. Well, <laughs> I do write why, plays. And why make, verbatim? I, what is it about verbatim in it, the fashion that you have fashioned it that has caught you? Um, I think there's something to be said for um, uh, for across all these forms. I like verbatim theatre because it's the quickest route to empathy. Knowing a story is real um, is the quickest way to make an impact. And there's, there's particular social justice goals with each of those works that I just outlined. April's Fool was designed so that 15-year-olds could watch it and have a reaction to what are the real-world effects to someone being making certain choices in their life to participate in a certain kind of lifestyle which means illicit drug use and to then be, have their life taken away. What effect does that have on your community? And to see that very close up and go, this is real to have an effect and to to have the power, you know, there's nothing more powerful than I've witnessed the beautiful actress Barbara Lowing taking on the role of Christian's mother and a room of 15-year-old schoolboys being silenced because mum's crying on stage. And that has a deep effect. Um, similarly with Gladstone and the Logan projects, the power of someone standing up and a real person from that community saying, I believe in this place, in Logan, to have a Samoan um, woman on stage, to have a police officer on stage next to a Sudanese refugee on stage and an indigenous man on stage and to have them all on stage at the same time and just tell their stories and then walk off stage together arm in arm, for that community at that time it was an incredibly powerful symbol and carried a tremendous weight for them. And again, that that empathy come and St Mary's I don't know it's still in process it's not on till September next year but that has had its own interesting process because that's Queensland Theatre Company which means similar to ABC Radio National um, it's a piece of work that people we need to keep people interested and it's a piece of work that people will pay money to buy a ticket and come and see a theatre show and there's expectations around what that means which has meant interesting kind of twi twists on the work and challenges for me as a writer about how to shape it. Yeah. We've spoken about that was going to be leading into my next question uh, this tension between the interviews mm. and the creative product and mm. how you've managed because we are here tonight to hear about presenting the interview so how do we go from the recording to something that's um, creative but still linked to what you've recorded. It's, it's always about, for me, it's an editorial process. You go, what's the, what's the um, key purpose of this project? So for April's Fool, it was actually quite easy because you went, is, is, a 15 year, is this going to contribute to the 15-year-old boy's experience of watching this show? Which meant awful moments like Christian's grandfather telling an amazing story about how he survived the Vietnam War just isn't in the show. Mm -hmm. It's not there. I'm the only person that knows that story and knows the value of it, but I had to cut it because it's not, it's not contributing to the overall feel. Sim I mean, there's just so many... Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just so hard being a player. <laughs> but similarly, you know, you get into really awful positions with the Queensland Music Festival projects, which are big musicals. Logan had a cast of 700, but because of um, the... Well, I say that number and, yes, it's... Big. It was a big show. Um, 
And because of, you know, normally in theatre, like a producer will say to you, we need it to be 100 minutes in length or we need it to be 70 minutes in length. In radio, like, you can't mess around with that. In most forms of theatre, you can kind of shove a big around. But with Logan, it's like, no, the council has shut down roads so that people can come to this show. If you go on one minute longer, you bugger up a traffic management plan that's been <laughs> being made so you can't stuff around. So you have to cut the story about the woman who lost her child but then had a renewed faith in her community. You just have to do it. In St Mary's, it's been challenging because the story of St Mary's is a story of diversity of opinions. So what started as a verbatim text has slowly morphed into a more creative text where you have to, ha you have to build abstractions upon certain opinions. So I can't tell this one person's incredibly intimate story about how they had their journey through faith, but I can perhaps create a character that has some of the essence of that, as well as some of the essence of that person, some of the essence of that person, to create a cohesive character that then both carries a dramatic purpose in the show for the audience, but also carries some of the story of those five people that I've interviewed. So that's that's where the rubber hits the road mm -hmm. as a writer. It's a, it's a balancing act and um, one that, uh, frankly, makes you lose some night's sleep. Mm, yes. Do you think... You've, you've spoken to me about a spider web of interviews and that you mm. are in, in a unique position in terms of the event that is the subject of the play. Um, does that come with a responsibility? Are you creating a greater understanding of the events because of your unique position? Do you think those... Inter because you... I don't know how that relates to... No, it's both... It's just I'm really interested it's in It's both question. a blessing and a curse. I mean, Tommy Murphy, who wrote Holding the Man which was originally a play before it was a film, but, of course, Tommy spent all this time with Holding the Man as the true Australian story about a, um, a, a gay couple um, and, and one of whom tragically uh, passed away from AIDS and the management of that process through the family of coming out and then dealing with this awful grief. Um, and he, of course, interviewed everybody. And he knew... Tommy eventually, through the process, figured out, oh, the mothers of the partners... Or no, the sisters of the partners had never met, ever. They just managed to not... And they both had these incredible memories of each other's siblings in incredibly important moments in their life. So Tommy suddenly had this ability, this gift to go, hi, here's this person's email. You should sit down and have a chat. And of course, that's an incredibly beautiful, wonderful part of the process. Similarly... It's, and it's a blessing in that way. There's certainly plenty of examples of that I've experienced with all the projects. Not quite as profound as Tommy's, but it's also a curse. In April's Fool, I managed to get an interview with Christian's drug dealer. And being able to sit with him and talk with him about his lifestyle um, and what he does and what... And then knowing to go back the next day and interview Christian's mother, there's an incredible kind of... You, you you are in a very um, tricky ethical place because there's an element of confidentiality and protection for all the people involved. And there's an ethical consent form signed of what, go, what you say is on the record is on the record, what you say is off the record is off the record. And, of course, people in interviews can very casually go, oh, da, 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 oh that's off the record, da, 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 you know, and you kind of go, what? Um, what? So you can kind of become burdened with this knowledge um, that can be... Uh, it's a responsibility to hold and it's a case-by-case -case basis of how you handle that information. Yeah. OK, thanks, David. No worries. We're over to Gavin. Gavin, are you prepared to come up near me? <laughs> Thank you. So profound. <laughs> We're going to the utilitarian end of the presenting of the interview. Yeah, I was um, actually. It's funny you mentioned that word because I, I wrote down utility, um, <laughs> and I, I think uh, people have talked about pragmatism in storytelling, and I, I think I basically have this really sort of Jekyll Hyde sort of relationship to oral history, where um, I think it, the quickest route to empathy was re that was a really I think succinct way of explaining how oral history cuts through and for me who I have done some oral histories and you know used to um, be explicitly working with oral histories at the State Library um, I think that 
and for State Library as an organisation, I think we recognise that. But then there's the other side to oral history, which is the pragma pragmatism, the hard realism, and it's actually just a really efficient way of getting st information. Like, it, it, it does cut to the heart of things, but it is also a really effective way of getting information quickly. Um, and I've done a few projects where you can have interviews with people talking very deeply about and profoundly about aspects of their life and you can present that in quite a rich and evocative way which brings people closer together but you can also from an oral history transcribe it reduce it to words on a well not even words on a page just digital words where you run algorithms which say if over hundreds and hundreds of interviews if these terms are closer in proximity to each other and there's a pattern to that, you can start to infer relationships between people, like a computer can do that. So there's that really cold element, but it does provide insight, I think. But there's also that really heartwarming element to oral history as well. And I think that's reflected maybe a bit in how um, State Library does its oral history. All right, well, that leads to the question, how does the State Library do their oral history, Gavin? <laughs> Uh, it, I mean, it, it's different. In well, I mean, I started as the oral history and digital to storytelling coordinator um, at State Library in two thousand and nine. I think. Come back. Yeah. Go back. To, no, sorry. Hel well, Helen Helen Clavey and Jean Burgess and Francis Good did a review of State Library's oral history program, um, and I, there was a gestation period, and I was born. You know, <laughs> but um, so. Yeah, I, I think what's we've got a decentralised model now where there's multiple people um, who are all responsible for oral history. And the benefit of that, I think, is like today, I was just... W there's up to about, you know, eight people who are working with actively collecting, commissioning oral history or collecting it. And then our catalogers have um, an awareness and are comfort uh, comfortable with oral history in a way that they never were. It, it's... Oral history has become quite just mainstream in what we do. It's it's not it's another tool. It's a part of the palette that we use to share and t um, to capture and tell Queensland's memory, which is kind of my, my thing. Um, but I, I think it's really today. You know, I was just talking to one of my colleagues, and she said, "Oh yeah," and you know, we're doing a project where Griffith Film School students will be interviewing artists. And she said, "Oh, I think yeah, they're going to do Bill Robinson like a couple of weeks," and you know, and it was this offhand thing. You know, oh, you're interviewing William Robinson, one of Queensland's most important living artists. That's a big deal. It's just kind of off. Like, uh, the everydayness of that, I think, was in a way has shown how far we've come. So, how it, the interview is the archival interview, and then there's the what I'm, I'm coining, coining a new term within oral history the applied oral history interview. Do you collect that applied, you know, with? Are we going to collect David's play as an artefact, perhaps, for the State Library? How do we, and, and if you do, how do you do that? That's a good question. Um, we've got a little bit of a precedent. We collected... Um, the First World War commemoration is a big deal for us at the moment. And um, we there was the, um, s the Black Diggers, um, uh, the QTC show, and we actually took an archive. That I think they simulcast it in about eight centres around Queensland at the same time, hence Simca. And um, it, we <laughs> had an undertaking to basically take a video. They were video recording it and we have taken an archival copy of that performance and put it in the collection. And there was a whole range of issues like, you know, we needed to negotiate with the union to pay the performers more because there's a difference between a one-off live performance and recording it and enabling people to look back at it at their own leisure, um, but we are the accessibility to material is a foundation of, of what we do. We wanted that to be accessible for people, for Queenslanders in the future. So, so we did that work. But I think it's a very different. I think it, you have to treat them as different things. And I think a awareness of the context around which a thing was cr the thing was created is really important because there's a real difference between sitting down and talking to somebody and having that conversation recorded 
and then having sound engineers, marketing people, promote a show, a playwright, write a script, performers perform it. That is multifaceted and how you capture that is a big question. How you, how you actually capture that in a meaningful way um, that provides a useful resource in the future. You know, you can stick a video camera there and video it, but is that, is, is that good enough? Yeah, that's right. How, do, how, do you, how does the user use it and, and the context? Um, yeah. So, Gavin, is there anything you'd like to... Oh, actually, I was wondering, really, again, back to that, um, before I throw it open to sort of general discussion, a lot of the people here will be doing digital storytelling and, um, you know, how, how would that be presented by the library? Is it, you know, does the library collect digital stories that yeah. people are um, using their... You know their interviews and then producing something that is um, their creation again. That's the idea of um, being applied. It's, f it's funny with um, it's funny with digital storytelling because I, I flippantly at a conference once I said I, th I think oral history is like test cricket, and um, <laughs> or digital because digital storytelling was like the thing. You know, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, everyone was like running workshops and. Um, self-produced first-person digital videos was the thing and it's like uh, staff colleagues at state library don't even think about that as a mo like it's all edited um an interview being filmed and then an editor down interview and like our ceo talks about digital storytelling or you know senior management talk about digital stories digital stories but it's like they don't know who joe lambert is like you know it, it, it it's interesting how it's just become a mainstream sort of thing. But I, I kind of think it's become a little bit like, not T20, I think I was wrong on that. I think it's like one day cricket and it's <laughs> it's looked at in these kind of rose tinted glasses now. It's kind of like Kerry Packer kind of World Series sort of stuff. <laughs> where oh, you just it, <laughs> it's, it's recently not that long ago, questions. the golden days of digital stories, but it's sort of, because it moves so quickly, it's only probably like five years ago that everyone was setting up multimedia kits or digital storytelling kits but there was also that um, naivety about it that was kind of endearing and I think we are a bit more savvy now. So it's being edited and produced and um yeah, I mean, I can jump in there because when we were making our do rad documentaries it became on the website you had to have a digital story, you had to have this kind of augmented program, you know, and a slideshow we call them as well, which would be a series of stills <laughs> and voice, you know, run through. And we actually never got any stats as to how many people were going to the website and playing those, you know, user stats, um, as opposed to people just listening to the radio program. Mm -hmm. And so we stopped doing it because you know, they, were hard, they were so heavily resourced. They take so, so many resources as well because people want to make them beautiful for three or four minutes that we had no idea whether people were even going to the website. So it is a bit like it's fashions come and go, yeah. I think, too. And you come back to this thing called the oral history sound recording and you've still got something really rich and pure. The thing. Uh, I'd like to just ask the um, panellists a few general questions and then we'll go to um, your questions. I can't wait for questions for Gavin for all you digital storytelling <laughs> producers out there. I'm sorry, it's still valid. I'm not <laughs> banging you. <laughs> you practice. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what makes... I know this is just so broad... The good interview. Um, something that um, hasn't been touched on yet. Um, I, 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 I'm equally interested in these responses. Um, I, um, I am very keen on a neutral space, uh, not public. Uh, it's uh, unless the interviewee insists on their space, their home or so on, which immediately tells you something about how they want to feel about the interview. Um, I prefer a room that I have some control over and it affects sound quality and things like that, of course, as well. I think it's also something that I am abundantly and self-consciously aware um, of who I am walking into the room. And I am a young, hairy male um, and that affects the interview and how they respond to me right off the bat. Um, Similarly, if, you, if I've got the credentials of Queensland Theatre Company, it's different to the response that you mm. get walking and going, I'm from the ABC or I'm from the Empire Theatre Toowoomba. You have, a, people may ha already have a relationship with the institution, which then dictates a certain kind of response. 
Um, I, and, and to be very aware of that. I've been interviewed, I was interviewed, I was a victim of oral history <laughs> recently. <laughs> uh, Participant. And, <laughs> and it was a very positive experience, but then I've also had negative experience. I was, I was um, uh, we, uh, I've been subject of a documentary before, uh, or a process I've been involved in, have had a documentary crew involved in it. And the producer was always like, didn't, f kept forgetting people's names, didn't, and so, of course, didn't get an ounce of vulnerability or good tape from me or many people involved. Um, so the simple stuff of being a gracious host to the guest who you're asking to take their heart quietly and for them to trust you with it, um, manners helps. But that's me. But I'm interested in another response. I mean, I think it's a, it's a sort of a loaded question, isn't it, what makes a good interview? Because you can interpret that, you know, in so many ways. I could put my radio program documentary makers hat and go, it's got to be, you know, it's got to be tears, there's got to be <laughs> class, there's got to be revelations, you know, they've got to be grip me in the seat so I just don't, can't turn the tape off. Or I could say a good interview is one where you establish trust, um, you get a really powerful, um, intimate uh, storyteller, um, um, and also something about a kind of a shared sense of trust. Um, so, you know, I guess what you ultimately want is for the interviewee to feel that it's been worth their time, that they've given up for you, um, but also that they trust you with that content, with that interview recording, because um, that's the most precious thing ultimately, because um, you are taking away yeah. someone's heart, their story. Uh, and you want them to have actually had a good time. Mm. Um, <laughs> mm. and, um, and generally it is, it's, there's something really wonderful about someone sitting down and listening to you. You know, it is just a wonderful, wonderful mm. thing, I think. Um, <coughs> particularly if you're actively listening. Mm. And um, I think all of those things, you know, make a good interview. And from playback perspective, all stories welcome. So we don't... Um, have a belief that a particular story is better or worse or a teller is better. And sometimes some tellers might speak much longer or shorter, but it's very much about what they want to tell and for us honouring that story. So we don't kind of think of it as what's the good story, but um, how well we can honour whatever stories come. Slightly different, perhaps. Mm. Right, Gavin. Uh, I think I was just thinking about. Well, I mean, I can give a corporate answer, but um, you could. I, th I think you can. You, you can tell a good story from your heart, or you can tell a good story from your head. And I think a good story from your head. Okay, checked off this topic. Yep, covered that. This is going to be a valuable historical resource. But I think you know it's a good interview from your heart. And from that is if you're listening to it and you've feel like you've, you you know you're not looking at the time elapsed you're kind of absorbed in it i think that's the sign of a of a good interview when you actually time dissolves away and you feel like you are could it even be part of that conversation so most of uh, we've sort of got a, a degree of distance from um, the interviewee to the in the presented interview with all of the panelists and so i really want to ask you about um, Keeping that trust, Michelle, that you've talked about with your yeah, interviewee, yeah. and you know the idea, uh, uh, we we see oral history as sort of grounded in truth, mm. to some degree. Or what? It, you know, we'll get metaphysical here and say what is truth, whose truth. But I, I'd like the panelists to think to to um, maybe consider about how they present the interview with an idea of honouring the interviewee's truth. Is that too? I mean, I think David has a much harder. Um, <laughs> has a much bigger challenge than, than I do, probably. Um, because I think, you know, when I go to the theatre, I want... I mean, I, the frisson of knowing this is true is great, you know, mm. and I remember being so excited by verbatim theatre when people like t Nick Enright started. Yeah. You know, really wonderful. The Newcastle, the Newcastle... There was a play about the Newcastle earthquake, which mm. was just brilliant. Mm. Astonishing. Um, but actually, I think there's a huge risk. There's a huge risk in what you do. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find a flak jacket on. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a tremendous responsibility. I think what your question points to, Margaret, is, is the essence of the truthful 
uh, the truthful um, situation, w what what that is, um, uh, what what is, and and when you're limiting, when you're editing down to that, you just go well. A big question in my mind is balancing these two ideas of what is theatrically interesting, and what is the spirit of what their what this person or what this story is, um, and that can be a controversial element. Mm. Uh, Funnily enough, the only time it's been controversial for me um, was recently in St Mary's where we wrote, I wrote this, the first draft of the thing and I, I invited all the people I had interviewed along to see a reading. And the vast majority were on board, um, but there were one or two who were very respectful but not happy with the result. But their, their, their narrative of what they had run in their head of how this story should go is that this person should be blamed, is that we need to single out this person and make sure the story is about how bad a job they did. Um, uh, whether that was for St Mary's, whether that was the Catholic Church, the institution, or people inside the St Mary's and Exile community. The thing that validated for me was that there were people displeased on both sides. So I kind of go, well, the truth is somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. and I'm not interested in, as a writer, or particularly as a human being, my job being to point at someone and go, you did a bad job. That's not what I'm interested in doing. I th or I think what anybody is interested in doing as an oral historian. If I was producing a current affair or today tonight, that might be a different story But because that's good and interesting tape for that format. But um, inside the theatrical format, it's you're, you're going to, what's the, what's the spirit or what's the essence that accurately reflects the data that I've picked up? Yeah. Jen, you sort of mm. reframe people's truth, don't you? Well, in a sense, because the actors interpret back the story that they've just heard, and we do um, use, sometimes it's literal, sometimes it's metaphor, to make some dramatic element, because if we just played it back as somebody said it, it wouldn't have the drama. Um, so there is a, a, an interpretation, but it's there and then, and um, the important thing again is listening to the heart and at the end of any enactment we look to the teller and honour that story back to the teller and most times I, I can't I've been doing playback for 20 years and I can't remember a time when a teller has said no nah, that was awful you know so most times there's something in the enactment that connects with them but we have interpreted um, we have kind of sometimes listened more deeply to what was actually said, what was under what was said, to bring and, and bringing that out, and bringing it out dramatically using movement and body and all sorts of things, music. So, I mean, yeah. would you say, Jen, that it's sort of thera therapeutic, it's it, a form of therapy it, as opposed... Well, I don't... Has, but this has been an ongoing right. debate. It yeah. can have a therapeutic impact. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's more community right. um, so building, building, but sometimes right. seeing your story... Um, it's like you see it from another perspective. You see the story that's in it's your head out yeah. there and it can be very validating and acknowledging of somebody's experience. Um, I, I'm reluctant to call it that therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, it, that's not the purpose of, of specifically playback, but it can have mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. impact. Mm -hmm. in, and it depends, again, on the context and the type of story. We've done performances for... People um, with mental health issues, for example, with an organisation, and perhaps it had more of a thought of a. Th but again, it wasn't. That wasn't the primary purpose. Does it just stay? Sorry, does it just stay in the room? I, I think once yes. it's done, it's mm. done. Mm. It's uh, it largely stays in the room. Occasionally, it can be recorded, and um, so that's where I think it's not quite an oral. Uh, a fundamentally history, different. You know, yeah. fundamentally yeah. different because it's not a recorded form. Uh, recordings might come afterwards or as in response to or before, but the actual performance is not um, normally uh, recorded for future or to, to archive. Occasionally it can be, but that's um, unusual. I'm just, go I, I'm just going to have another question for Gavin because um, the library has issues about presenting the interview in terms of legal issues, defamation. So how do you sort of... Yeah. guarantee that you've um, presented the interview in a way that's not going to open up any sort of liability for the interviewer yeah. or the institution. 
Um, I mean, one of our biggest things was to um, look at the risk in putting oral history material online and putting that on our risk register, which is the same risk, reg risk register that looks at the risk to the organisation if it floods and the same thing if, you know, um, there's a fire or there's a catastrophe somewhere. So it was looking at what is the... Because I think it does contextualise it and it puts it in some sort of perspective. It's, you know, this is an oral history interview and generally the majority of our recordings have been created with a sense of goodwill. So it's like, let's look across the board at the level of risk this organisation is put to and then um, let's see where it lies and we we have an agenda and we've got a, a you know a brief to try and make this material as accessible accessible as possible I think I mean the legal stuff and all that kind of and, and privacy is an issue but I think probably one of our issues is just more of a technical issue of how to make it um, digestible easily findable and integrated in your life it's like you know we have um probably up to about a thousand interviews now or digital stories through our catalog but it's it's like i mean i, I don't even feel like going on and looking at something through our catalog clicking on something putting on my headphones and listening to it we've got a really rich you know collection but i think the difficulty in presenting is actually to is actually it's a communication design issue of how you make that easily um, uh, digestible and, and relevant to people. And we won't start the transcript versus um, summary time summary debate tonight. Uh, no, we we'll, we might um, open up for questions. So Chrissy's going to Christy's going to. Oh, we've got questions. I guess this is a. Um, uh, a question for all the panellists. Can you reflect on what you can see might um, come about in the future um, from the perspective of the audience? So what what new experience can we hope for that's not like the description Gavin just gave of um, going through the catalogue and mm. sticking your earbuds in, but something that's closer to my favourite experience, which is hanging out the washing while listening to an ABC... Um, uh, podcast through headphones. Well, uh, exactly. Podcast, I would suggest, is really um, changing the way that we're thinking about our programs um, and we're really heading down the line of, um, if this answers your question in some way, at least from my position, um, aggregated an aggregated offer. So we'll have a podcast stream of radio programs that might be about be poetry programs or we'll have a podcast stream which will only be history, oral history programs largely, um, um, but that might include the occasional sort of expert driven history program. There's a program called Rear Vision on Radio National. Um, so I think that is the future. Um, I, I feel ambivalent about that because I think some of the most wonderful experiences I've had as a listener um, to radio is the serendipity <coughs> of hearing someone that I, you know, oh, not Barry Jones again, no, but actually he was riveting. You know? <laughs> or Clive James, not Clive Jones again. And so I just wonder about that, but I can see that it is the future because of what technology has thrown down, that the option to be able to choose what we want to hear when we hear it. Uh, sorry, I think in terms of access, I think the linking of play, like physical places and sound is something which is really interesting. And through GPS and, you know, devices and that sort of thing, it's becoming more possible. And a few people are having a go at it. Um, I know Hamish, Ke um, Hamish Seal from um, from Sunshine Coast has, has got a program up. But I, I'm, I think it's n still a bit clunky for mine, a bit of the technology. It's not seamless and it's not... I think it will only work when it's integrated with existing patterns of behaviour. If you have to force people to do something that mm. they mm. don't normally do... I think it's a disincentive to do it, but if it's as natural as, you know, walking, turning on the car or doing whatever you do anyway, it it feels if it feels natural, I think people are more inclined to do it. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I was thinking about it because 
playback or uh, playback as a form, it is about the audience and it's about building the connection. And um, so it's not about the technology. So it's about you know, encouraging that connecting between people, which has been happening for millennium and hopefully will continue to uh, occur. It's um, so the audience is part of the creating uh, of the the story and the future. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure how that might change, um, whether people are more comfortable sharing stories with others in groups or less. I'm not quite sure. Um, it's uh, I, Similarly, as a storyteller, podcasts is um, a world that I'm just splashing into as a creator and enjoying it very much in terms of its freedom and its ability. And as a user, I love it. It's the way I listen to the majority of radio. But in terms of theatre... Um, theatre hasn't changed, on one side of the coin, theatre hasn't changed much since ancient Greece. But uh, things like playback theatre, which is wonderfully innovative in one sense, and um, there's other, um, I'm going to criminally forget the name of any of the creators or even the show, <laughs> but uh, a show I saw recently which was verbatim theatre where the actors had headphones in their ears so they were hearing the interview as they were presenting the text. Awesome. The audience couldn't. Rosalind Ode. Yes, yeah. yes, it was over at the powerhouse and it was about a um, boxing, boxing champion. And it, that was exciting and interesting and I can do a theatre history lecture if you want about <laughs> where that's come from and verbatim theatre and its contemporary form has come from Agiprop in the which has came out of the world. It, blah, 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 it all comes back to ancient Greece. But <laughs> it's, it's, I think, as young creators, of which there are many in the theatrical world, it's a form that we keep experimenting with to varying degrees of success but the idea of fundamentally being in a room with someone as they present a story is something that is that connection that we'll always yearn for I think mm. and perhaps one other thing that just thinking of the connection or, or in the using playback it has developed it's been going for about 40 years but more around a form of dialogue around difference so having people in a room who might have very different views about this is something that I'd like to see where it, it moved to, which is quite a tricky thing, mm -hmm. but to be able to really listen to the other's story to in that moment and to find the similarities. So you tell one story about your experience and yours is very different and, you know, in another context you'd be um, perhaps like that, whereas creating a place... And I know a woman in New Zealand who's been doing some really interesting work around this dialogue and really listening to the other using playback and story. Um, yeah, so that might I mean, be something of... Extrapolated a version of that is the Truth and Reconciliation yeah. Commission. Yeah. Yes, um, similar, yeah. And there's been some really interesting um, oral histori analysis of them from oral historians, particularly a guy in South Africa, Sean Field, mm. who's also talked about the limits of what... Because I think yeah. we, you know, something that struck me tonight that we haven't touched upon really is the limits of... Or, or the fact that as... And I'm particularly I'm thinking about as someone who works with oral history and, in, and makes a, a, a documentary out of it, a form of media, we fundamentally have to accept that the person is telling us the story that they want to tell us. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I'm particularly thinking when I was a much younger person and interviewing um, a, car, a man on the carny, Sideshow Alley, and, um, and he just told me this story that made the whole life sound fantastic. You know, it was wonderful and they were in this luxurious trailer with blue you know, velvet and um but when i turned off the tape he said oh and you know we lost our two daughters um they suicided a drug overdose and um and in a, in a way that was sort of partly as a consequence of this particular form of life that they worked in um and i remember thinking oh but that's that's only half the story then we've got this nostalgic version of you know life on inside show alley but i had to accept that that was the story he wanted to tell me Yes, um, I've got a question. I, I, ju I just wanted to talk about. This one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, about being interviewed, the Australian Generations History Project. I was interviewed by that chap, Hamish. Hamish, yeah. 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 And when, when they told me that I was going to be interviewed, I had all these thoughts in my mind that going through the different stages, the different years, and everything. But when he interviewed me, I was thrown off task because he'd asked me questions about different things and then I'd loo lose the time sequence and I'd be jumping from one time period to another. And I felt a little bit uncomfortable about it because 
so many different things happened because I had 70 years of history to talk about and so many changes went on in, in society. Being a history teacher, I really like to do it in a historical type of framework mm -hmm. and tell my story that way and I felt very uncomfortable and he did want to come into my own home to do it. Mm. Mm. Now, the other thing I wanted to tell David was David... My first school was St Mary, South Brisbane. Mm. I was there from 1947 to 1951. Mm. I was there when the grotto was put up. Mm. So uh, I'd be very interested in your play. Oh. Thank you. Well, as Thank will you. I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> well, let's see what happens. I've, I'm getting the tickets. <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, your, your statement really um, focuses on the fact that we do need to consider the welfare of the interviewee in this <coughs> process. Uh, and that's, you know, when we present the interview, whose who's agenda and who's, um, and, and the purpose. And I think, Jen, you, uh, you, was, you were talking about the purpose and that's key to presenting the interview. Well, yes, it's depending on what the purpose, obviously all of us here have different purposes some at different times for the interview that, that we're doing. So it very much depends on the purpose of why you're doing it and who you're doing it for and the person at that moment, you know, in playback, our purpose is to honour your story that you, you wish to tell in that moment. And I guess my role sometimes is to assist you to tell that, but it's not about, or we, we need, you know, tonight we're having a stories of childhood, but you want to tell a story about when you're an adult, sorry, go away, we, we're not hearing that story tonight. Um, we don't do that, we just accept whatever story comes forward, yes, and to to mold, I guess, in time frames and things like that, we, we're mindful of that mm. as well. You see, in, the importance of the pre-interview, yep. you know, and if you don't want... You want just enough surprises during the interview. You don't want... <laughs> <laughs> see, and, and ours is total surprise. We have no idea what the yeah. story's going to be. Never, you know, like... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's really yeah. terrific to hear your perspective, mm -hmm. though, because mm -hmm. often, as oral historians, we don't hear <laughs> from the experience of the... Hopefully there was a feedback form or something that you could, you know, write in, because, in fact, you know, I, I, I was involved in the Australian Generations Oral History Project from, the, from this perspective over here as um, a program maker, um, um, and I certainly was aware of the five-hour interview, you know. Um, and I remember looking through at that long list of questions that the interviewers had to ask. Um, and it's interesting, you know, in a way it sounds like it was quite frustrating for you. It was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, it's very... Uh, I think it comes back to the framework. I can understand I, you know, this is a part of the job, of, of Michelle's job, that I would find very, very challenging, which is that you've got... a deadline to fill and that's coming and you've got to do it. I'm very lucky in my position to, I clear like half a day. I, I aim and I say, look, we'll probably talk for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And sometimes we do do that and other times we don't because my last question is, is there anything else you want to say? And then there'll be, <laughs> that can lead to another two hours. And sometimes depending on the information that's being shared, I will go, okay, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm overwhelmed. I might come back to you or you can write this to me. That's fine. Other times when you're dealing with an issue of deep personal grief or deep vulnerability, you go, if this is what this person has to get through in order to trust me that I'll treat the story respectfully, then I, it's a couple of hours of my time and I'll sit here. But not everybody has that luxury. Um, and, and, and as journalists, you're put in a very, very, very difficult position where you go, I need this and I need this and I just need... And that's very tricky. And it takes a someone with incredible emotional and social intelligence to leave that interaction with all parties happy and with you going, I've got this and I've got my time that I need and to manage that is, is, is the journal... I would think the burden of any journalist's life. I mean, it's worth noting, though, that the Australian Generations Project was absolutely... Its primary goal was as a digital sound oral history archive. For the National Library of Australia. Mm. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, Michelle. People, some people might, might not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry, I can't speak to any specificity mm. on that project. Yeah. Um, we've got another question up the back here. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Um, leading on from that question, what preparation you do with individuals or with communities like St Mary's, with whom I also have a connection, 
or the Empire Theatre. <laughs> I also have a connection there. <laughs> <laughs> That's Brisbane. <laughs> and Toowoomba. Yeah. And the Downs. <laughs> yeah. um, so just how you explain what you're doing with the project, how you explain what, uh, what purpose you have behind it, yeah. how you bring people on board. Um, well, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that I find very, very difficult, um, particularly in something like the Queensland Music Festival productions, talking about big, large-scale community spectacles, the type of which are deliberately things that are things that we know our audience hasn't seen before. And trying to explain to them the process or the product is um, difficult. Trying to explain to people who may not have much theatrical experience what verbatim theatre is or what the process will be is can be quite bewildering. Um, it takes it takes a certain amount of time and kind of gentle encouraging to get to get that al get that along for some people. And it's also like I think for all of us, if you don't want to be interviewed, that's okay. Like, and I make that very strong point. Um, in terms of preparation, I tell them, look, this is where we're headed. There's a piece of writing that says I'm going to artistically interpret what and you know your words may be used you can go on the record or off the record you can be anonymous if you want you can call me I leave a seven day window to go if you freak out and call me the next day and go do not put that in then that's okay um, and and that's the form it takes I go in with a spine of questions of like I, I want to ask about this and this and this but I allow for a lot of tangents because I'm uh, I'm looking for, uh, I suppose a point of difference is I'm looking for the surprise. I'm looking for the anecdote that I don't expect. I'm looking for the point of view that I haven't heard from yet. And I make time for that, which means I end up with a lot of tape. Um, but that's just part of my process and what I do. Yeah, so that's me. But I think, you know, when I said earlier that we, we approach our interview ease with this sort of directed sense, ah, oh, that person, uh, I remember here in Brisbane actually interviewing, finding a series of bodgies and widgies. Um, it took me to Sandgate, which was fantastic. <laughs> and, um, and I certainly knew that those people, you know, had identified as they were youth in the 50s and 60s and bodgies. Um, and it is sometimes, and you know, I do say to them, look, this is for a radio program um, and, you know, I'd like to hear your story about what it was like. And, and so people do have that sense that they know that there's going to be a public outcome, a public iteration of this. Um, and But sometimes people forget um, mm. in the middle of the telling the yep. story. And another woman here who was a British child migrant who had the most extraordinary experience of being in St Joseph's near Cole um, and named all these names of priests and, <laughs> um, um, and the Sandgate bodgy man who was just lovely, who um, didn't tell me this in my pre-interview, what we say on the, on the telephone, um, that in fact he'd been in jail, you know, at some point as a result of riding a motorbike somewhere and, you know, probably almost killing someone. Um, and that went down on tape, but I didn't end up putting that in the radio program because I just felt that was the point at which... Um, so I think it's that thing about the, the public knowledge that they their story is going to be public. And as I said, I'm often really surprised that I get so few knockbacks um, I think it's really changed over time too because I think people have become used to the confessional. Um, mm. You know, we, we live in a confessional age. Uh, whereas once people say, oh, I haven't got a story to tell you. No, I've got no, I've been to very... And that's really changed. I think we've got our last question, Anne. Um, oh. <coughs> okay. <laughs> thank, oh, so um, thank you for being so patient. Uh, yeah. I just want to pick up on a point probably that Gavin made earlier and it's maybe been picked up in the conversations, but really in looking at how to make interviews um, accessible and, and interesting and to comment that people have shorter and shorter attention spans. Mm. So while some of the interviews have got shorter, it's still really like how short should they get and is it going to come down to just those short grabs? And a bit like when Facebook came in, you, you wouldn't think people were telling their life stories in just these little sentences and grabs, but how popular that is. So will that become the way of the oral history projects? Mm. I think it's not how it'll be captured. <laughs> I think um, you won't get any quality or depth of story in it. Like, you need to spend time with people to get quality outcomes. So I think the shortening 
is on the uh, delivery sort of side, post capture or whatever. But um, I think how that's done, I think, um, yeah, it's sort of like that question of people who now are publishing natively to Facebook, you know, like a lot of people, it's not a full article, it's just that, that snippet. But I, I think, um, how much do you actually remember from an interview either? If, when you've listened back to it, you probably only, I mean, I d- don't know the stats, but there's a thing of, you know, you only soak, your brain only soaks up a few kind of key pertinent things. And yeah, there's a lot of, it's the tone often and the sound of someone's voice that stays with you. But um, I could see it, cultural institutions, you know, um, or whether you can do the equivalent of just exploding like um, a part of an interview. So you could um, hover over it and it's in effect like the exploded quote in a magazine, you know, so it's like, it's, it's a pointer and I think it'll be getting to the point where people can then delve deeper if they want or they can have the, you know, the, the cursory quick potted history. Another question? Sorry, sorry. I just want oh, to sorry. say, I, I would actually, I'm not, I, I don't go to Facebook for oral history. <laughs> um, and I think that it's very, I'm, I'm Gen Y, I should have the shortest attention span in the world, but I listened to a two-hour conversation with Mark Maron on you know, the WTF podcast regularly, or just today I was listening to a Radio Lab oral history story and the program was about an hour and a half long. Serial as a podcast mm. is a 12 episode story about one lawsuit and it's been downloaded millions and millions and millions of times, many of whom by young people. Mm. Um, and similarly with ABC, you know, you, you, you have stories of length and depth and measure there and there is quite clearly an audience for them. Mm. Um, I think there is a pressure on creators to be good. I think there's always a pressure on creators to deliver works of quality. Um, but I don't think um, creators should underestimate their audience's attention span ever because I do think we will listen. Um, mm. it, we, we will if given the right format and the right opportunity, but yeah. it's not Facebook. And there's a separate issue, I think, because I know it's relevant to the National Library and their digitisation of their sound recordings, um, about the sound archive and you know what you make accessible and what people will come to and what researchers needs are as opposed to more performative um, iterations of oral history or testimony um, life stories um, um, so I mean I, yeah I, I, I personally have a real kind of question around the National Library uploading five out of five because most of the Australian generations interviews were five hours um, and I'm not sure what you'd un, uh, the stolen uh, the um, forgotten Australians were the you know institutional histories. I can see a real kind of connection there if you were institutionalised yourself about wanting to go to the National Library. But I'm I, I wouldn't want to go to a five hour interview. I think journals use them for quotes. I think because there's text, they just right. search across it. Right. Quote like th- that is you wouldn't need to listen to it, would you? No, no. Right. You're just mm. interrogating the text. Right. Yeah. Which is like the total other, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's very cold. Oh, I just wrote down a question earlier, um, Michelle, when you were talking about those doctor's recordings that were scratchy and horrible and you couldn't use them. I mean, it's too late now, I'm sure, but if they were really good... Um, stories, why couldn't they have just been re-spoken by somebody else? Yes, look, it was, it was a colleague of mine in the Professional Historians Association in Victoria um, and she'd been commissioned by this hospital, I think, and there were these fantastic... So they'd be done on a micro-cassette recorder, which mm. these things that... And the cassettes were sort of specifically made for the brand. Mm. Um, and even though we've got a, a geek at work who collects old technology, he, got, he had the Sony version that they were Philips recordings. Um, and possibly they could have been sent off to somewhere where um, they may have been salvaged. Um, but certainly they weren't, the project wasn't for a radio documentary. Um, and um, it's just tragic yourself, you know, that you know there's this kind of stories there that you just think would never be 
lifted again that we'd love to hear. Um, so I sort of see that as an historic document that's like potentially unusable. Um, but there are, there are ways around, you know, we can do so much fantastic cleaning up <laughs> of cassettes. And um, so for the most part, I feel quite positive about old recordings. It was just in that instance I couldn't help this, um, this colleague, this friend. So Gavin, we might, uh, just in terms of that, what are the standards for the State Library for all those non-digital stories that you're, or the, wh whatever okay. we're going to be doing in the future? For broadcast the Wave. <laughs> right. Uh, the digital standards are on our website, but yeah. it's Broadcast Wave, um, 48 kh at a minimum, 96 if you can, 24-bit. <laughs> yeah, people... Goggly, goggly. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not really on. Um, I can mean... You, can you, you do that on your iPad? No. <laughs> can can you can? Can, can it go to 96? Yeah, it can. Oh, cool. Okay. This um, is the revolution, isn't it? Mm. So. Yeah, I think it's it. people, that idea that you had to have equipment to do things and that equipment was um, like an impediment, I think that's mm. that's probably one of the biggest things to change. And I think it's actually hard for people actually to get over that, that they don't need equipment and that it's actually the equipment doesn't matter, that it's actually the, the skill and approach um, to, to interviewing. that That's quite challenging because sometimes I think people thought, I've got a recorder, it's going to do the job, and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, I mean, basically, if you record at the highest rate, you can because you can um, go down in quality but you can't go up, essentially. Okay, I think no more questions. All right. It's just been an absolute honour to chair tonight. I um, am so grateful. I have to admit there are, that everyone here is actually my friend. So um, thank you for letting me twist your arms to be here. Not that I needed really to do much twisting. So thank you very much. Could we show our appreciation for our <laughs> wonderful panel? <laughs> Some gifts from the um, from Oral History Queensland. Ooh. You get the small one. <laughs> I was just talking about the Ecker, which I knew nothing about, but okay, it's like being at the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just do a little plug. If you have cloaked anything uh, down at the uh, welcome desk, it is important that you allow enough time to go back down there to collect before 8 o'clock this evening when the doors at the front will be closed. So if you can make your way outside to have a, a catch up with each other, um, the most, the latest you can be here is about five to eight, unless you cloak. Thank you. I, I just wanted, to, for those of you interested in seeing Playback Theatre, we're performing on the 20th of November at the Latvian Hall and it's stories of childhood. So I've put some um, postcards out the front, so please, if you'd like to come along and experience, and it's not quite oral history, I wouldn't quite, but um, come and experience uh, playback theatre. I'm sure you'll enjoy it very much. I do ask a question, Jen. If, if you do go along, do you need to participate or no, can you be an no, observer? No, absolutely not. You can just sit and watch and enjoy. 